Okay, confession time. I've kept this a secret for decades, and I think it's time that I was honest with you all, because I don't like to keep secrets from people. Okay, okay, here goes. I am a really big fan of Tim Burton. I know, I know. Listen, this is as big of a day for me as the day that I came out as bisexual. Shock and horror. Nobody saw that shit coming. Like every other goth that grew up in the 90s and 2000s, it's pretty universally known that Tim played a big role in shaping our lives, from identifying with his stories and characters, to dragging your mother to the nearest hot topic and looking for Sweeney Todd hoodies on the sale rack. Burton's movies have been analyzed to death, so today we'll be talking about something else that played a big role in shaping my dumb childhood. Hope you all have your emotional support peacocks ready, because today Today's video is going to get a little more personal, a little sappier, and a little more... empathetic? Weirdo, weirdo, weirdos, yeah. Greetings, my good bitches. The name's Francis, Coke Francis. I'm a filmmaker, stand-up comedian, drag artist, and I'm here because you manifested me during your last full moon ritual. In 1997, when I was but a wee ankle biter, Burton published a collection of poems entitled... The Melancholy Death of Oyster Boy, and other stories. By this time, Burton already had a number of classic films under his belt, including the one that made me question my sexual orientation and solidify it. And that my good bitches, was the moment that I knew. Also, you have no idea how many times I've listened to Selena transforms while getting into drag. Sorry, got distracted talking about Batman Returns. As usual. Meow. Anyway, in the mid-2000s, I started middle school. I went goth, began hating everyone, and haven't looked back since. My best friend had a copy of this book, and since I had made the recent decision to make Tim Burton movies my entire personality, I eagerly sought it out as well. The fact that this book is in this good of a condition is nothing short of a miracle. I carried this bad boy around like it was the goddamn Death Note. It was my source of power, and no one was allowed to touch it. Now my hair fulfills that role, but that's besides the point. These darkly humorous poems all focus on children and other humanoid beings with freakish deformities and other quirks, all existing in a world of normies. Some have greater social metaphors, others are more lighthearted, some are simply absurdist, and others aren't even poems at all. When I was a kid, I did genuinely love this book and its characters, and not just because of the aesthetic that contributed to my baby bat lifestyle. Now, I do literally everything for the aesthetic, because I no longer have anything to prove. So come join me for the most depressing installment of Drag Queen Story Hour as we look at a book that shaped who I am today. Before I begin, and because it's the year 2022 and I need to bring this up, I am already very aware of Tim Burton's problematic behavior and his history with racism and sexism, and as someone who is quite literally raised on his work, it hurts me to admit that he's not the best dude on the planet, but I will still admit it. And as much as we wish for our artistic heroes to be good people, please keep in mind that they didn't go into their line of work to be humanitarians, and unfortunately we need to just accept that being talented doesn't mean you're not a douchebag. He's a goofy artist, not a miracle worker. So for the sake of this video, and before you go rushing into the comments, please know that I am already aware Tim has his blind spots. Let's please extend some grace for the next 15 minutes or however the fuck long this video is going to be. With fresh grown up eyes, I'll be reading five poems that support or relate to my thesis or whatever. And the best part is, I have AIDS. Visual AIDS. Mr. and Mrs. Smith had a wonderful life. They were a normal, happy husband and wife. One day they got news that made Mr. Smith glad. Only Mr. Smith. 
Mrs. Smith would be a mom, which would make him the dad. But something was wrong with their bundle of joy. It wasn't human at all. It was a robot boy. Um, did you just assume your robot's gender? He wasn't warm and cuddly and he didn't have skin. Instead, there was a cold, thin layer of tin. There were wires and tubes sticking out of his head. He just lay there and stared, not living or dead. The only time he seemed alive at all was with an extension cord plugged into the wall. That's how you know he's a boy, according to conservatives. Mr. Smith yelled at the doctor, What have you done to my boy? He's not flesh and blood, he's aluminum alloy. The doctor said gently, What I'm going to say will sound pretty wild, but you're not the father of this strange-looking child. You see, there still is some question about the child's gender, told you, but we think that its father is a... Microwave blender? This is the same decade that moon shoes were invented, so... The Smiths' lives were now filled with misery and strife. Mrs. Smith hated her husband, and he hated his wife. He never forgave her unholy alliance, a sexual encounter with a kitchen appliance. The straights are at it again, people! And Robot Boy grew to be a young man, though he was often mistaken for a garbage can. Yeah, we all been there. So this poem didn't go over my head or anything as a kid, because I was 12 and therefore a self-professed sex expert, but that last line did hit a little different. I guess this has something to do with inheriting your parents' trauma, or it's just another extension of Tim's daddy issues? I don't know, I'm probably reading too far into this, but that's what this channel is all about, so suck it, Tim! Moving on! Of all the superheroes, the strangest one by far doesn't have a special power or drive a fancy car. Next to Superman and Batman, I guess he must seem tame. Oh well, yeah, it's a pretty high bar you're setting there. But to me, he is quite special, and Stain Boy is his name. He can't fly around tall buildings or outrun a speeding train. The only talent he seems to have is to leave a nasty stain. Sometimes I know it bothers him that he can't run or swim or fly, but because of this one ability, his dry cleaning bills sky high. Get it? Another classic Burton underdog character here, and apparently this was actually made into a web series in the year 2000, which was Burton's first dip back into the waters of the superhero genre following Batman Returns. There it is again! Anyway, Stain Boy is still a much more useful superhero than Paper Man, and I love him too. The next poem was my favorite as a kid, so let's see if anything's changed. To those of us who knew him, his friends, we called him Roy. To others, he was known as that horrible toxic boy. Horrible toxic boy is my father's name. Call me Roy. He loved ammonia and asbestos and lots of cigarette smoke. What he breathed in for air would make most people choke. His very favorite toy was a can of aerosol spray. He'd sit quietly and shake it and spray it all the day. Hold up. This is hitting a little too close to home. He'd stand inside of the garage in the early morning frost, waiting for the car to start and fill him with exhaust. The one and only time I ever saw Toxic Boy cry, I thought his name was Roy, was when some sodium chloride got into his eye. One day for fresh air, they put him in the garden. His face went deathly pale and his body began to harden. Wow, big mood. The final gasp of his short life was sickly with despair. Who would have thought that you could die from breathing outdoor air? As Roy's soul left his body, we all said a silent prayer. It drifted up to heaven and left a hole in the ozone layer. Okay, good. That's a nice Christian ending. Jesus Christ, that is way too relatable. I think I put more holes in the ozone layer just by doing this wig. Okay, this poem is still my favorite. Also, just look how cute this little guy is. The next one isn't so much a poem as it is a familiar concept. My name is Jimmy. But my friends just call me the hideous penguin boy. And we come full circle. For reference, this book came out five years after Batman Returns. That movie Trojan horsed its way into my life, your life, and all of pop culture, whether you like it or not. Also, is it just me or is Jimmy super cute too? I mean, just look at this face or lack thereof. Okay, good bitches, the moment you've all been waiting for. Our titular character and his bananas depressing story. Here goes. They put melancholy in the title, as if they had to. <laughs> he proposed in the dunes, they were wed by the sea. 
Their nine-day long honeymoon was on the Isle of Capri. For their supper, they had one spectacular dish, a simmering stew of mollusks and fish. And while he savored the broth, his bride's heart made a wish. Adam Carolla would be pleased. Their wish did come true. She gave birth to a baby. But was this little one human? Well, maybe. Ten fingers, ten toes, he had plumbing in sight. He could hear, he could feel. But normal? Not quite. This either sounds like an anti-abortion campaign or eugenics. You decide. This unnatural birth, this canker, this blight, was the start and the end and the sum of their plight. She railed at the doctor. He cannot be mine. He smells of the ocean of seaweed and brine. You should count yourself lucky, for only last week I treated a girl with three ears and a beak. That your son is half oyster, you cannot blame me. Have you considered by chance a small home by the sea? Should Tim use his fortune to open the Burton Hospital of deformed kids as a result of their mom's fucking non-humans? Leave a comment below. Not knowing what to name him, they just called him Sam. Or sometimes, that thing that looks like a clam. Shit, I know like 10 Sams. I should check on them later. Everyone wondered, but no one could tell. When would young Oyster Boy come out of his shell? When the Thompson quadruplets espied him one day, they called him a bivalve and ran quickly away. Oh yeah, well at least his mom's vagina's not a fucking clown car, bitch. One spring afternoon, Sam was left in the rain. At the southwestern corner of Sea View in Maine, he watched the rainwater as it swirled down the drain. Oh boy, here we go! His mom on the freeway in the breakdown lane was pounding on the dashboard. She couldn't contain the ever-rising grief, frustration, and pain. Really, sweetheart, she said, I don't mean to make fun, but something smells fishy, and I think it's our son. I don't like to say this, but it must be said, you're blaming our son for your problems in bed. Oh yeah, it's the son that smells fishy. Sure. I'm 12. He tried salves, he tried ointments that turned everything red. He tried potions and lotions and a tincture of lead. He ached and he itched and he twitched and he bled. The doctor diagnosed, I can't quite be sure, but the cause of the problem may also be the cure. They say oysters improve your sexual powers. Perhaps eating your son would help you do it for hours. Sorry, son. Doctor's orders. Holy shit. He came on tiptoe. He came on the sly. Sweat on his forehead and on his lips. A lie. Son, are you happy? I don't mean to pry. But do you dream of heaven? Have you wanted to die? Good lord, Tim! Sam blinked his eyes twice, but made no reply. Dad fingered his knife and loosened his tie. So I guess one blink means no, two blinks means what the actual fuck, Dad? As he picked up his son, Sam dripped on his coat. With the shell to his lips, Sam slipped down his throat. What in the Terry Gilliam is going on up in here? They buried him quickly in the sand by the sea, sighed a prayer, wept a tear, and were back home by three. A cross of gray driftwood marked Oyster Boy's grave. Words written in the sand promised Jesus would save. Does Jesus exist in this universe too? But his memory was lost with one high tide wave. So there's that. None of this really went over my head as a kid, but I gotta be honest, it definitely hits different as an adult. Not just because I have more life experience and therefore have experienced more trauma, but because I've just developed a more nuanced way of living my own life as a weirdo. I think I can speak for a lot of people when I say that Burton's work made me feel special and it offered me comfort at a time where it was very much needed. When I entered adolescence, my anxiety and depression had kicked in for the first time, and I didn't know how to handle it. Two of my closest friends abandoned me and betrayed my trust, all because they decided I was too weird for them. I got bullied for my sexuality before I came out. I had frequent clashes with authority figures, and yes, I developed a sense of style that didn't exactly help with how much I was being bullied, but now people sent for it. That's fashion, baby. And I wasn't the best person either. No middle schooler is. Seriously, have you seen Big Mouth? And because I didn't know how to handle my own pain, I let it out on other people. I'm grateful for the fact that I was able to apologize to them, but the damage had been done, and I became very lonely and isolated. But throughout all of this, especially considering I didn't have many friends left, Burton's characters genuinely felt like family to me. 
But enough pity partying. Eventually, I grew up and developed a sense of irony and realized the reason I saw Jack Skellingtons everywhere I looked is because Burton had such a mass appeal. I realized that I wasn't actually that special at all and the whole nobody understands me identity started to feel cringy and cliche. And then that fucking Alice in Wonderland remake came out and my love for Burton's work pretty much went downhill from there. Now that I'm in my 20s and my brain is fully developed, my nostalgia boners are inevitable and I'm no longer ashamed of loving what I love, no matter how cringy or cliche it might seem. I had the same relationship with my love of anime. I was so paranoid about being lumped into that anime club at my high school that smelled like a combination of feet and pita chips that I couldn't just distance myself from it and love what I love. On that note, you're in for a real treat with my outfit in the next video. Wank. And don't get me wrong, I still enjoy the fuck out of Tim's older movies, and I always will. But all my dumb jokes aside, rereading this book had a surprisingly profound effect on me, and reminded me of why I loved it in the first place. And here I am, making a whole ass video about it, and my 13 year old self couldn't be prouder. Also, that Oyster Boy story was fucked up then, and it's fucked up now. Jesus Christ, Tim! Tim! Of course, Burton doesn't share his grotesque doodles or sad stories just to make people go, Damn, Tim, that is sad and disturbing. It's very clear where Burton's sympathies lie. He sees the humanity in these monstrous children. They're not just scary, they're heartbreakingly sad. I mean, just look at these poor bitches. They're still pretty cute, though. This book is tragic in the most classical sense. It arouses fear and pity in order to purify and purge those emotions. Burton's art helps validate that feeling of not fitting in and makes us feel less alone. Because these stories are bluntly metaphorical and often extreme, they offer catharsis. That's why Burton has mass appeal. Deep down, we all identify with his characters in some way. We all have our imperfections we all have our ugly side, and we've all felt like we don't belong at some point. We've all felt like freaks, we've all dealt with loneliness, and most of us have had mommy and daddy issues to some degree. I mean, not me though. Ew. At the end of the day, there's nothing particularly special about being labeled as an outcast or even identifying as one. What is special is what you decide to do with that label. And Burton is the patron saint of those who channel their alienation into creating art that brings people together. It inspired me and many others to do the same. And that my good bitches, is something special. This book has so many more brilliant poems that I didn't cover, so if you enjoyed this video, please immediately close this tab. In fact, turn off your computer and phone altogether and pick up a goddamn book, especially this one. But not before dick slapping those like and subscribe buttons as hard as you can. Oh, but one more thing, the winning comment from the last video. Orange the Human says, It's criminal how your videos only get a couple hundred views. I found your channel yesterday and binged every video! Liked everyone and subbed, trying to do my part to get the algorithm to push your content more. Keep on keeping on. Great production value and funny af. Anyone who likes both John Waters and Dead Kennedys are my kind of people. Holy shit, that genuinely made me tear up a little, and I love you. And I love anybody who took time out of their day to listen to a drag queen's public therapy session. You too can be featured in the next video. Leave a comment below and I'll pick my favorite one. Thank you, Orange the Human, for inflating my already huge ego. Creep it real, normies. And as always, until next time.